not spend time <clears throat> presenting the project. That's my colleague's case task, who is next to present. But I'll seize the opportunity and, and present myself. I'm indeed a member of the IPTRN steering committee. I'm an Icelandic geographer and graduate of Durham University in England. And I currently chair the Cultural Geography Research Group at Wageningen University in the Netherlands, where I now live. I work on spatial theory and issues of regional development, landscapes, perceptions, and the in particular, mainly focused though on the Arctic. So here I've left my uh, case of presenting me, at least, and now I would like to simply hand over to Case to present the PROACT project and the PROACT team, which is the focus of this. I think you're muted, Case. All right, do you hear me all? Yes, we can. Yeah, that's wonderful. Thanks very much, uh, Edward, for the introduction and um, the kind words. Yes, um, this is not a start of the presentation. Sorry for that. Yeah, it's a, a great honor to be um, a part of this uh, webinar. Um, the network is well known to me. I have been participating in the uh, in the network in Abisko, I think 2010, um, and it's it's great to be back. Actually, I do not have a good excuse not to be there in the uh, years in between. That that just is a matter of uh, busy life and other things. But uh, it's it's very good to be back, and it's also a, a very uh, big privilege to uh, to present to you the Proact uh, project. Proact stands for Proactive Management of Antarctic Tourism. And what I would like to do in a very brief presentation is to just sketch the international context, the aims and the four main themes of the project, uh, our envisaged approach and output and the uh, research team. It's uh, about the Antarctic. Uh, generally, we will define that as the area south of 60 degrees south latitude. And as you know, the Antarctic is uh, uh, the topic, uh, the uh, subject to an, uh, an international regime, the Antarctic Treaty System that started with the Antarctic Treaty in 1959. And Elena will, uh, will tell you some more about it. But there are also other conventions that are part of the um, Antarctic Treaty System. I won't discuss them all, but uh, some are very important for Antarctic tourism as well. For instance, the Madrid Protocol, uh, signed in 1991, entered into force in 1998, um, and that regulates, uh, yeah, uh, apart from a few exceptions, all activities in the Antarctic. And these uh, activities also include Antarctic tourism. Um, but since the uh, adoption of the Madrid Protocol, we have seen a, a very, yeah, large increase of tourism, both in growth uh, as well as in uh, diversity of activities conducted in the Antarctic. Of course, this year, uh, this season, um, we have um, very uh, low numbers. Uh, we expect that that will uh, come back. Um, but since the, uh, particularly 1989, 1990, 1990 um, the um, numbers have uh, grown substantially. And uh, Michael and, and uh, um, uh, Joshua will discuss uh, both growth as well as diversification, as these are central topics of uh, the, the first two th themes of the uh, PROACT project. And what we have also seen, uh, or actually not have seen, is decision making. There is very little decision making in the Antarctic Treaty system. When the protocol was uh, negotiated in, uh, in 1990, 1991, um, there were a couple of countries that actually proposed to have a, a separate annex for Antarctic tourism to the Antarctic Protocol, but uh, consensus could not be reached on that uh, topic. And the topic has actually been on the agenda of all Antarctic Treaty consultative meetings uh, since then. So um, actually uh, 30 years of, uh, of, of uh, quite a long period of, of deliberating also on the Antarctic tourism. The Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting is the meeting, and here's a picture on the, on the right uh, uh, below uh, side, um, is the, um, the meeting of the 29 consultative uh, states that uh, uh, jointly manage the Antarctic and govern the Antarctic. There has been adopted two uh, measures in 2004 and 2009, 
but measures are meant to be binding, but then that requires um, formal ratification, uh, so formal approval of all uh, consultative parties that had that status when the decision was made. Um, and still uh, both measures uh, are waiting for more than 10 ratifications. So since um, uh, the protocol and Annex 6 uh, on liability in 2005, no um, legally binding instruments have been adopted. And that uh, raises quite some concern for NGOs, governments, but also scientists. Here are just a, a few of those uh, yeah, expression of concerns from scientists. Huh? The stakes are high. This really is the last chance we have to leave a piece of the planet close to the way we found it. And also more recently, these statements have been made in uh, very high standing um, and natural science uh, uh, journals. This is one of the reasons why in the Netherlands, um, a policy driven research program has started um, and uh, that not only related to, uh, to tourism, but also many other issues. Uh, so it was an open call for policy driven research. Um, and our team was happy uh, to receive the message that we were uh, actually one of the three um, uh, programs that, uh, that re uh, received a very good assessment and uh, also the funding. The central aims of PROACT um, is to map and understand the tourism developments a bit better uh, and to relate these developments to the Antarctic Treaty system, fundamental principles and values. Uh, and just to uh, mention uh, a few of those uh, that are very important, uh, Article 2 of the protocol designates the Antarctic uh, as a natural reserve devoted to peace and science. Article 2 also states that the aim is a comprehensive environmental protection. Um, Article 3, uh, first paragraph, uh, reflects or makes explicit which values are considered very important in the system, and these include wilderness values, for instance, as part of the intrinsic values of the Antarctic. Uh, and also quite some interesting resolutions um, yeah, reflect what the general principles and values are that are actually the subject of consensus among the consultative parties. Uh, for instance, one of those general pr principles uh, adopted in 2009 is that tourism should not um, attribute to the long-term degradation which is Article 3.1 of the protocol, including, for instance, wilderness values. So we would like to study these, um, yeah, the relationship between those tourist developments and these principal, uh, principles and values, and study then in that light also legal and other tools and approaches for strengthening regulation and management of Antarctic tourism to actually uh, find opportunities to fill that regulatory gap. Um, in doing so, we also want to learn from best practices elsewhere, uh, particularly the Arctic, but possibly also other areas in the world. Uh, and um, based on academic output, we would like to develop a policy advice. Four themes are central to the, uh, pro uh, to the um, uh, PROACT uh, project. Tourism growth, um, tourism diversification, uh, domestic implementation legislation, in particular the question who is, um, which country is actually regulating what activities, and the role of non-use and non-user uh, states in the Antarctic Treaty system uh, with a particular attention for Antarctic tourism. Three PhD positions and one postdoc position, um, and these will be installed in um, or working for three universities. It's a consortium, uh, and we aim to um, yeah to really form an interdisciplinary team uh, to strengthen each other. So this presentation is actually our first uh, real joint uh, um, effort to uh, to show what we will be doing. Uh, and we are very much looking forward to that. So close cooperation is uh, the first component of our approach, three universities involved, but we also are uh, seeking cooperation with international experts, for instance, uh, through an established scientific advisory board, but also through networks like the, uh, uh, the IPTRN uh, network, but also the Polar Law Symposium, for instance, um, the um, uh, network for early career uh, polar researchers, uh, scientific committee for Antarctic research, etc. We also would like to um, establish cooperation with policymakers and stakeholders because this is policy driven research, so it is. It should be very uh, good research, so it starts with the academic uh, quality, but we want to reach out and connect with policymakers to make sure that outcomes can be used by policymakers. Uh, 
Um, our focus is the Antarctic Treaty system, but we also uh, would like to learn from uh, best practices elsewhere um, in the world. Uh, output is particularly related to academic outputs, so PhDs, article, uh, uh, articles, presentations at, um, at uh, networks, of course, like, like this, but also at conferences. But we also would like to have policy related outcomes. So you might uh, envisage, for instance, um, results that have, uh, that have been found to, uh, to be translated to a sort of working paper or information paper or maybe a background paper uh, to the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting, for instance. And also we hope that um, uh, our cooperation and uh, information might be valuable uh, to IATA, the self-management um, regime or system for, for uh, the uh, tourism industry. Um, and lastly, we also would like to uh, outreach to the general public. This is the team. Uh, Edward already introduced himself. And maybe I, uh, I can just uh, um, stop sharing the screen and ask uh, Eric um, uh, as the first next one to uh, introduce himself very briefly. Yes, uh, thank you, um, uh, Kees. Uh, thank you for your introduction. So my name is uh, Eric Mo. Utrecht University. Um, I'm a Deputy Director of the Netherlands Institute for the Law of the Sea. Uh, so I'm a lawyer and my research is really any interaction between uh, international law and the polar regions. Um, so I did my PhD uh, mainly on uh, shipping issues. And after that, I, I did a lot of uh, research on international fisheries law and then the polar regions. Um, and I'm also participating as a legal advisor to the Netherlands in the in CAMELAR, the Commission on the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources. And I've also been involved in the negotiations on the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement. So thank you. Thanks, Eric. And it's wonderful to have you in the team with all this uh, experience, also in practice, also a very active role in uh, advising the uh, uh, Dutch government in relation to Kevlar and other issues. Uh, Magiel, can I ask you to present yourself? Yes, uh, yeah, good evening. Well, or well, well known to the, uh, to the network, I know. But... Yeah, good evening, good afternoon, good morning. Uh, Magiel Lamers uh, is my name. I, I am an associate professor at Wageningen University in environmental policy. And uh, my, uh, my uh, research and also my teaching, it, it focuses a lot on, on, on tourism, sustainable tourism and, uh, and the uh, relationship between tourism and nature conservation, mostly in coastal and uh, marine destinations and uh, yeah, with, uh, with a particular focus on the, on the polar regions. Uh, for, for me, it is, it's really nice to be back in the, in the Antarctic with this project. And uh, it's also it's it's it's, yeah, it's also very nice to, yeah to be back in the International Polar Tourism Research Network. Uh, it's it's great to see all these familiar faces and names. And um, well, I uh, maybe one last thing. I I I, I was always the, the the one who had visited all international polar tourism research conferences. Um, I failed one, the one in Canada in Dawson City. Um, but I might be able, uh, yeah, to indeed join the, the join the next one uh, if we are uh, if if we if if we, if we are doing well in this project. So I think that's it. It's really nice to be here today. Thanks very much, uh, Magiel. Bas, could I ask you to uh, present yourself and maybe switch on the camera if you want? Yes, sure. Um, my name is Bas Amelun. I'm an assistant professor at the Environmental Systems Analysis Group in. Um, I teach and I also do research on the interface between tourism and environmental change, in particular climate change and uh, water issues. Uh, but uh, 10 to 15 years ago, I did a postdoc project on tourism in the Antarctic, also together with Magiel, who did his PhD on the same topic back then. And I see also a number, uh, quite a few familiar names in the list of participants from that uh, time. Uh, so I'm happy to be back in this uh, field uh, as a member of the Project One team on the feasibility of a cap and trade system for tourism in the Antarctic. So that's uh, my introduction. Wonderful. Thank you, Bas. And uh, my name is Kees Basmeyer. I'm a professor of nature conservation. I'm 
my main focus is uh, the role of law in protecting nature. Um, and I uh, focus on international issues, but also uh, within Europe, the Natura 2000 uh, regime, for instance, but also in the Netherlands. So I like to uh, be involved in all those governance levels uh, with a focus on the role of law in protecting uh, nature. Uh, and for my international work, I particularly focus on the uh, on the polar regions with an emphasis on the uh, on the Antarctic. So with this uh, and uh, yeah, I, I find it uh, very interesting to actually have the opportunity to uh, to be in this network and to present this uh, project uh, project from a more general introduction perspective. Uh, but the more interesting things have um, actually are still on the agenda because these are the more uh, substantive. Um, um, introductions to the four projects. Um, so I think I will give the floor back to you, uh, Edward. Yes. Thank you, Kees. Uh, so Kees has uh, given the general context of the project and introduced the project team to which I belong as well. So I'm one of those to be presented. Now we would like to roll on to the present, uh, presentation, pre presentations themselves of the four themes. However, we do have a couple of minutes according to the program. Uh, and I wonder if there are any questions out there that uh, would like sort of for more clarifications about the project. And I do notice in the chat. Yeah, that's basically greetings to everyone from <laughs> that people are happy to see each other, albeit virtually. But if there are any questions just to for clarification from Case, if there are anything that you would like to ask Case uh, at this moment before then, and as Michael uh, prepares for presenting uh, theme one. Please feel free to uh, either open the mic and put on the camera or, or put it in the chat. All right. I see nothing in the chat nor no cameras popping off. So then I will ask you to mute and, and switch off cameras for the uh, Oh, right, here is a question actually. Is there a capacity for visiting scholars under the, sea, under the sea, scheme? Case, uh, do you think, uh, what do you think there? Capacity for visiting um, scholars? Yes, funding in the Netherlands is always uh, uh, very precise. So if you get money for something, you have to uh, spend it to that particular uh, issue. So we have not a, a bulk uh, uh, amount of money to spend on the topic. Uh, so the unfortunate answer is uh, no in financial terms. Um, but most of uh, the uh, universities in the Netherlands, including the three, uh, I, I think have quite some actually uh, hospitality policy in the sense that um, if you are, uh, are very interested in cooperation and you are working on a, a similar issue, uh, very often there is a, an empty room, um, certainly in this time of the uh, of the pandemic, but also later on, uh, and there is always a, a computer available and very often is if there is no funding uh, involved, um, the hospitality is very high. But funding is is uh, is more difficult uh, nowadays in uh, in academic life, uh, and that also applies uh, to this project, uh, unfortunately. But thanks for the question. Very good. Yeah. Thank you, Deborah. I maybe pitch into this a little bit as well. In, in at Wageningen, in my chair group, we do have a visiting professor scheme or visiting scholar scheme, uh, whereby a project like this, if you uh, if you are engaging and contributing there too th that can be activated so then again applies the same the hospitality is there but the funding is is not implicit in the in the uh, proact project itself but the, the, we are very open to welcoming people at least in Wageningen and, and Tilburg and, as, and Utrecht I'm sure as well um, any other thank you Deborah uh, any other questions okay then I would like to give the floor to Michael, and uh, I assume you'll introduce yourself and, well, theme one, please take it away. <laughs> Great. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, anybody? Yeah, good. <laughs> this is my first online presentation ever, so I'm a little bit nervous. It, can everyone see the proper slide? Yeah, good. If you don't say no, I'll assume it's all good to go. All right. So. As Edward said, I am theme one or project one, and I am located at Wageningen University in research. Uh, my name is Michael Kachpalia, and I'll be tackling this first building block of proactively managing the growth of Antarctic tourism. 
So uh, this is, you can see the Achenea campus here back in February, we had a real nice cold snap. So that's our normal the swan pond got turned into the skating pond. So perhaps it's not so different from Antarctica as it would first seem. So you've already met um, Bost and Machil, my supervisors. And as you heard from Bost, they both worked there extensively and published extensively as well. Machil even did his PhD there. But you've already met them. So now on to the, the young gun or not so young anymore, perhaps. I just turned 40 last week. Uh, I'm originally from the US where I got my bachelor's of science in first wildlife biology and then a master's in resource conservation. Um, I worked in those fields for over 10 years in the US and all over the world, eventually meeting and falling in love with a Dutch girl. Uh, married her and moved here about five years ago. And in my previous life, I've worn professional life. I've worn many hats from Alaskan fisheries biologist to English teacher, to actually being a small business or tourism entrepreneur um, here in the Netherlands. And then at some point, the siren song of academia pulled me back and I got my second master's in tourism studies from Wageningen graduating last year. And now I've just started my doctoral studies on March 1st. So uh, the aims of project one, theme one, that is to systematically assess the dynamics of the growth of Antarctic tourism and historical debates, both political and academic, uh, going on about the restrictions on it, especially since the 1991 environmental protocol of Madrid. And two, to not only look at these debates, but also explore the viability of a system of tradable permits for Antarctic tourism, more or less a cap and trade system, uh, looking not only to provide a proof of concept, but actually develop the critical design elements for its implementation there. So a bit of background. This is my most beautiful slide. <laughs> I wish I could take all credit for it. It's actually from the Royal Dutch Meteorological Society, but I did do the English translations myself. Uh, and this, of course, just shows the dramatic growth of tourist numbers in Antarctica. Basically, commercial tourism began at the left side of the screen back in the 1960s. By 1992, I think about 6,500 tourists arrived there. And that growth continued to accelerate at a rapid pace through the 1990s and 2000s. By 2008, 46,000. Visitors made their way to the ice. And of course, the next year, you can see this precipitous decline here coinciding with the 2008 uh, global recession. But no fears there. The tourism rebounded uh, quite quickly. And by 2015, it had surpassed 2008 levels. And it's picked up steam ever since, approaching exponential growth. So now we've gotten to 2020. Last year, prior to COVID, of course, uh, that number exceeded 78,000 tourists in total. And you can see the numbers here on the right hand side, adding up to a more or less a grand total of 78,000. The exact numbers for this past season aren't represented in this lovely uh, infographic, but of course there'll be another steep decline in visitation because of the pandemic. However, once COVID restrictions are lifted, the growth is expected and projected to continue as before. Um, and I suspect perhaps others as well that it might even go faster because people are chomping at the bit to get back out there. Um, now, just looking a little bit closer, you can see that this shows not only how many people arrived, but how they arrived. And in the blue portion, you can see that the vast majority of people have made the journey by cruise ship after first flying into Ushuaia um, with that nice picture from Pat at the beginning, firing our imaginations. Now, in this inset here at the bottom, you can see that uh, well over three quarters of all cruisers go on to take land excursions onto the continent. Um, and just a small amount, well, 18,000 <laughs> remain on board. And although back in the day, these orange blips, you can see where people arriving by plane for exclusively land-based excursions, um, more people did arrive that way, but at the very tip top here in the upper right-hand corner, we can see that just 700 tourists arrived by plane that way in 2020. So uh, all that this is to say that Antarctica has become a hot tourist destination, despite as uh, case talk, anyone is a nature reserve, natural reserve, devoted to peace and science. Now, um, not only do we have a lot of people coming to Antarctica nowadays, but they're also spatially and temporally concentrated. Um, these maps here are based on data from 2012, um, but they start to show how concentrated tourism impacts are. The, the little green dots, both here in this red uh, square on the Antarctic Peninsula and, and continuing over into the inset, the little green dots show the 20 most visited sites on the continent and they're all on the Antarctic Peninsula in 2012. This figure um, 
going a little further from last year from Anshin Neumann um, shows how tourism has begun to spread out. Some of these most visited places are now all over, but of course the primary focus, the highest concentration is still all packed into that Antarctic Peninsula for many reasons from its proximity to South America, to its milder climate, to its higher concentration of historical sites and um, excuse me, historical monuments and science stations. Now, uh, temporally speaking, um, as most of you being polar researchers know, the Austral summer months are November to March. So nearly all visitors, whether tourists or scientific, are arriving during those months because of extreme weather conditions outside of that time. So a lot of people arriving in a short period of time in actually a relatively small piece of land. So where are these tourists coming from exactly? Well, if you look at this uh, lovely pie chart here, um, now, as for many years, most people um, are visiting from the US with 35% this year, I think 36 back in 2018, 2019. However, an interesting change could be seen taking place if you looked at these um, statistics going back in time, that while the proportion of tourists coming from many of the top countries, such as the US, Australia, Germany, the United Kingdom, while many of these have remained relatively consistent in their pole position over the last decade, visitation from China has risen steadily in keeping with global trends. And in 2018, China surpassed Australia to become the second most represented country today. Now, this was long predicted, but it's striking nonetheless, because, of course, Chinese tourists bring with them different cultural backgrounds than the hitherto predominantly European and North American visitors. And accordingly, their, their new norms, values, and expectations must be taken into account. So who is operating this tourism in, Antar in Antarctica? Well, as most of you know, nearly all under the auspices of IATO by its members. Uh, it's important to note that membership is voluntary and they focus mostly on self regulation almost entirely. And you can see their vision in the bottom right corner there, um, noting that minor and transitory impact on the environment really is a key phrase there to keep a hold of. So they were founded in 1991 by a coalition of seven operators. And today there are over 100 private sector companies and organizations in total making up IATO. Now IATO gains between two and five new operators or members each year. And with over 63 vessels in use, their members made a total of 432 voyages to Antarctica and the 2019-2020 season. Over the years, their expertise and proactive approach to self-regulation has been recognized and lauded and their representatives routinely take part in the ATCMs, the consultative meetings, as they're seen as the expert organization on tourism. So we get to the challenge itself, the problem definition. If tourism continues to grow, cumulative impacts are likely to exceed that minor or transitory limit placed on them by the environmental protocol. Now, a number of consultative parties have noticed this and taken uh, note of their concern, and general principles have been set for tourism governance Case touched on quite a few of them. Uh, Elena will talk about them more. But truly, a comprehensive and binding, a cohesive strategy is still lacking today. Additionally, monitoring, research, monitoring and research have been long called for, but the proper funding and finances have never been earmarked for those purposes. So we still yet have yet to really see those things coming to fruition. Now, we see this as that the ecosystem services, these values of Antarctica are being provided for free as a common pool resource to the tourism industry. Um, aesthetic experiences, spiritual experiences, pristine landscapes, uh, wilderness, wildlife, all these things are a common pool resource that's being freely given to um, IATO's members. And of course, they are then going on to offer high quality, high cost experiences based on those services. And while IATO members have done an admirable job of self-regulation, largely proactive over the years. We propose that with these growing numbers and higher tourism volumes than ever before, the independent oversight and new tactics have now become necessary. So as these challenges are intersecting in such a way that uh, a new opportunity has arisen, and that is to harness tourism to fund conservation research and management. And we propose that at least one way to do this is to create a system of viable, excuse me, tradable, visitation permits. This could be designed along the lines of a cap and trade scheme is what we're looking at right now. Familiar to many through carbon trading and such examples as the EU Commission's trading scheme. 
Now, the two main strategic goals that we hope to achieve by using a cap and trade system are to first and foremost cap tourism volumes, and that could either be at a desirable limit to achieve social or environmental goals, or a pragmatic limit that would be more acceptable to stakeholders. And of course, secondary to that uh, is to generate revenues for conservation, for monitoring for whatever the ATCPs decide that it should be spent on. And we feel that by combining a regulatory approach with a market mechanism such as this, we hope that this dramatic shift in Antarctic tourism governance can be made more acceptable to industry than a typical command and control approach, which is actually in keeping with the historical or origins of the cap and trade scheme. Now, ultimately, we hope that we say that the goal of putting a price on ecosystem services is to avoid yet another tragedy of commons, something that everyone can agree is desirable. So getting to the research questions. One, how can the growth of Antarctic tourism since the adoption of the environmental uh, protocol be qualified? Two, what arguments for and against have been used in response to policy options to restrict tourist volumes in Antarctica? Three, which are the viable Im implementation options for the critical design elements in a cap and trade scheme for Antarctic tourism? Four, what options are there to implement a cap and trade scheme within the current institutionalization of tourism in Antarctica? And five, how can the stakeholder experience and experimentation with a simulated system of tradable visitation permits help improve the feasibility of an actual system? So I'm just quickly gonna to touch on my research trajectory here. Uh, currently, I just began on March 1, as I mentioned, so I'm deep in the midst of my literature review at the moment, and I hope to submit my proposal sometime this summer. Um, but by next fall, I will be focused on the critical design elements of the cap and trade scheme. So we'll be looking at the, these major pieces, such as the height of the cap, um, selecting the end users or designating them, the initial permit allocation, and of course the collection and earmarking of revenues, all um, highly contentious, no doubt. Moving into year two, uh, I plan to go into data collection, and that will be interviews with key stakeholders and organizations, such as tour operators themselves, IATA representatives, and potentially looking at talking with other expert organizations such as ASOC and Camler. Now in year three, I'll kind of go back to the books, hit the stacks again, and look at these institutional arrangements. Um, do we have sufficient conditions with ATS and with IATO that they will be able to manage something such as a, this cap and trade scheme? Will we need to expand their mandate or will we have to explore actually creating something new like a trust fund along the lines of the Svalbard Environmental Protection Trust to independently oversee um, the entire system and the disbursement of funds? Then uh, we propose to use the methodology of a serious game to, uh, so at that time, I'll be designing it and implementing it among those stakeholders to simulate both the permitting system, the trading system, and the aim is to not only get their useful feedback to improve the policy proposal, but to enhance participation and potentially buy-in. Ultimately, the final policy plan will, of course, be shared um, with the AC ATCM, the Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting, and the Committee for Environmental Protection. Uh, not only to pro hopefully provide best practices, but as well to bolster the Dutch position within those things. So, of course, we anticipate some bottlenecks. It won't all be smooth sailing, as any good journey to Antarctica. <laughs> so, uh, these are just to name a few. Uh, defining the end users, nations versus tour operators, tour operators versus IATO. The allocation of permits uh, almost certainly will be controversial. It could be something along the lines of grandfathering um, from historical use, or it could be something more like auctioning. There is an important distinction to be made between scientists and tourists as visitors to the continent, although according to the UN World Tourism Organization, everyone who visits Antarctica could be defined as a tour. We wanna to look at whether or not the institutional setting could be prohibitive. I mentioned carbon trading before, but of course the situations where we've seen cap and trade systems before typically have a kind of central governance like the EU in the case of the emissions trading scheme. Um, that's entirely different in Antarctica as case mentioned. And finally, perhaps looking at the creation of a, uh, an actually more exclusionary system. Of course, cruising to Antarctica is already a very exclusive tourism destination. And by uh, implementing this system, no doubt the prices will rise and it will become accessible only to even wealthier tourists. So these are just to name a few um, potential bottlenecks we see in this project. But really we're here today at the very beginning um, in the sixth week of my PhD to invite all of you lovely people, names and faces 
to think along with us just as we take the very first steps on this journey. So really your feedback is welcome both today and anytime um, we are open to that. So thank you very much for your time and feel free to contact me um, at my Wachenegger email um, or through Case or any of the other supervisors. So thank you all so much for your time. Thank you, Michael. Wonderfully right. done. Clear Thank and you. concise and rolled out nicely, I think. And I can see hands clapping already <laughs> in, the, in the audience. <laughs> Funny to see them clapping, but that's how it is. <laughs> so um, I think we have a couple of minutes for if there are some questions for Michael, if anyone wants to uh, say something about the theme one, uh, how to manage the, well, the cap and trade scheme and ideas that he was here presenting. Now, I'll leave it open in the chat. And of course, if I see any hands raised, then feel free to do so. Uh, otherwise, the plan is, hey, Barbara, I see uh, you're coming in here. So Barbara, question or comment, please. Well, that was an accident. I, I have a question for you, Michael. I can jump in. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> um, Michael, I wonder if you or your team has has given any thought to the use of the the cap and trade system uh, in terms of a mechanism to encourage operators to be members of IATO, right? To give mm -hmm. IATO some teeth in terms of if you're an IATO member, this is how you look. And if you choose not to be, because over the years there have been many that have not been IATO members, but but it kind of makes no difference to them. Um, I'm just wondering if you'd given that any thought. Uh, yeah, no, not particularly from that angle. Yeah, um, as common with all of us PhDs and postdocs you'll hear from today, none of us have done prior research in Antarctica actually. So this has been a, a trial by, well, I guess not by fire, a trial by ice over the last six weeks. So yeah, really please bring it on, man. <laughs> any other, um, Suggestions like that we love, but yeah, yes. of course. Yeah. So, so that's just a suggestion, throwing it out there, something to think about, whether or not it's relevant in three years post COVID, who knows, but uh, just putting sure. it on the table. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, it's sort of an, an added incentive to IATO membership. I think it is. I think it is, uh, yeah, I think it is Pat, if I may, uh, because it's one of the of the of the issues indeed. Um, um, uh, because a lot of, of responsibility now lies uh, with, with uh, IATO. And it really depends, I think, in this question, uh, yeah, what role they get in such a, in such a, in such a system. If they, if, they, if, if, if they can become the, in, in the key inst inst institution re re like, re like responsible for, uh, for this, I think it will, it will, it, it, it will increase their position and uh, and also increase the possibility to make sure that uh, that that operators will uh, will uh, will uh, will uh, will join be, uh, because then it will be on on the, on the, on their terms and that is of course also how things have been well have been going so let's say let's say so far um, but it is one of the of the of the risks indeed uh, that we need to take into into consideration I notice also I have a, an announcement of a raised hand by Debra and also a raised hand. So Debra, please. Debra Ensenbacher, if we have your video and audio, then. Debra, you're up. And okay, whilst uh, if Deborah is not coming in, I see Peter Keller also raising his hand. Peter, if uh, we can get your video audio, thank you. Yes, good. Good morning, everybody from um, Canada. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. So, uh, Michael, uh, well done. I think a very, very exciting research uh, project. Um, one of the things that uh, immediately comes to my mind uh, with any of these sort of control systems is. Um, what are the motivations of the players and, and who is left out or um, who will be disadvantaged? And so, you know, um, of course, uh, managing the environment and, and, and this fragile, beautiful part of the world is really important, but how does it avoid corporate interests uh, from beginning to dominate the, um, the cap and trade system? And how would such a system handle the, the very small um, two operators or even the 
the private person, maybe the private yachts person who, who wants to take uh, her or his boat down to, to Antarctica. So uh, any thoughts on that? Peter, thanks for the question. Yeah. Um, well, as I mentioned in one of the bottlenecks, yeah, we, we of course have foreseen that, that this is uh, going, yeah, rather in, away from the direction of inclusivity. Um, I think that those are things that I'll definitely uh, take into consideration as we begin to design the cap and trade. I mean, one of the things that if you look at some of the emissions trading schemes, such as in Europe, um, they don't always work perfectly, right? Which tells us that the design of this thing is very important, which is why I'm trying to take into account um, context, uh, the implementation of the cap and trade from different settings and contact, empirical contexts around the world. Um, I think that, and Basa Machil, of course, this has been their baby for some years as they shepherded it through the funding process. So if they'd like to speak for me, then they're welcome to, but that is definitely something that I'm attuned to. Um, and will be certainly in uh, the front of my mind as I begin the design process. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Bas Bachiel, would you like to pitch in a, a couple of words or, or should we leave it? Uh, Bas, I see your mic is off. Yeah, well, I think that that's a, that's a danger that uh, maybe corporate interests uh, become dominant. On the other hand, I think also the, the added value may be larger for the smaller cruise ships, maybe smaller players than for the um, the bigger players that, that compete more on price, I think. So, uh, yeah, so we, we have to see uh, how the margins are, I think, and uh, who can pay most money for these permits. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not sure if, if it's the big players that, that have the biggest margins and pay, can, pay, uh, can pay the most money. So that's, we have to find out. That sounds like research to me. So with that, yeah. uh, <laughs> thank, you. Thank, thank you, Peter. And uh, I wonder if Deborah is there to say or, or if we move to the break. Uh, we have a break scheduled and uh, we will reconvene on the hour, in 10 minutes time, on the hour, wherever you may be in the world. Um, so please do make the opportunity to stand up wiggle around, get a fresh drink, coffee, and we'll be here back on the hour for the next presentation. Uh, Deborah. Hi, sorry, I'm having some technical problems here. I'm not okay. in an office. Uh, thank you so much for, for this event and this meeting of minds. It's so important. And also, a couple of points to uh, direct to Michael. One was, uh, Given your focus on cap and trade and your new entry into this arena, uh, I'm just interested in uh, what, what attention you might consider giving to the ATS mechanism. Oh, this is not what I wanted to do. I'm just trying to solve. De Deborah, I th yeah, the sound is actually not very good. I'm thinking if we take okay. a break now yeah, and, and sure. we okay, let everyone off the hook and, and we try to figure out the technicality so we can engage you in the conversation that we have indeed scheduled on the program. So, but for now, let's break and meet again on the hour. Make sure you come refreshed. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Just to catch the nice conversation going on. So welcome back everyone. Um, I hope you have gotten a little break and settled in nicely for the coming three presentations in a row. We'll present uh, three more of the themes of the four themes of the PROACT project, and then we will enter into discussion and before a final wrap up by Pat Mayer in the end, ending within the hour. So the hour, my time at least, let's hope the clocks are more or less rolling similarly around the planet. Um, we are back and we're starting again. Three presentations out of the four uh, before uh, for the next 45 minutes when before we open into a general discussion and then a wrap up by Pat Mayer before the hour is over. So next presentation is Yosra and uh, I will simply give you the floor now and uh, if you share your screen and see yeah. how that goes. Yep. Yeah. Screen is shared and Yosra, floor is yours, please. Uh, let me just, did I, 
uh, can you hear me? I think I, yeah, okay, great. Uh, so thank you all for being here today uh, in this new normal online conference. I really do hope that next time we can meet and have this uh, chat in person and that I can provide more information on the development of this PAG. My name is Yozira and I'm going to present the second part of the project project named Proactively Managing Diversification of Antarctic Tourism. Just a brief introduction. I am from Brazil and I have a bachelor's in leisure and tourism from the University of Sao Paulo and a master in tourism management from a two-year joint Erasmus Mundus program by the universities of Southern Denmark, University of Girona in Spain, and University of Ljubljana in Slovenia. That was a lot of universities, but there is one more coming. Uh, my master was done at Universidade Tras dos Montes in Portugal, uh, where I worked as a tourism research fellow studying the impacts of tourism in the Douro region. Outside of the academic world, I worked as a sustainability project manager in the hospitality industry in Norway, and also with environmental restoration in the Pacific Northwest region of the United States. I am right now in Brazil, finalizing the visa and residence process, and very excited to start this PhD at Wageningen University very soon. My supervisors are Edward and Case, as you already met them. So the aim of this PAG project is to explore tourism diversification in the Antarctic, considering the integration of less tangible concepts of the Antarctic Treaty System in order to provide information for the Committee of Environmental Protection to develop a framework for conducting free assessments for new, novel, or particularly concerning activities. As Michael already mentioned in his presentation, tourism in the Antarctic has been in prison over the last decades. And some of the reasons for that are related to this desire to travel to the unknown, to be in exclusive places where not many people have been or can go, or in the so-called less chance tourism, as concerns about climate change keeps rising. Uh, for instance, just a few days ago, a research by Gilbert and Kito uh, came out and was shared on some online magazine stating that at the current space of global warming, a third of the Antarctic ice shelf is could collapse by the end of the century. And apart from, of course, this being a massive tragedy, many tourists see this kind of news as an opportunity to go there and experience it before it's gone. So in the 2019-2020 season, uh, we had more than 74,000 visitors traveling there and more than 52,000 uh, went to the continent with cruise with landings. As Michael also mentioned, the numbers are similar. More than 70% of the total type of visits included landings or land-based tourism. Visitor activity on the continent mostly happen at this northwest tip of the Antarctic Peninsula, also the closest place from South America, where most tours start. And 98% of all tourism that takes place on the continent occurs in this in small zone you see on the picture on the left. And for a comparison, a polygon with the same area has been overlaid in Europe, covering basically only the Netherlands and Belgium, a bit of Luxembourg. So to have a good visual idea of the size of the tourism concentration uh, that Michael also mentioned in his presentation in the Antarctic. Over the years, tourism offers expanded from cruises and small boat trips to a very diverse range of activities and including cross country skiing, stay at luxury camps, rock climbing, kite surfing, private aircraft flights, kayaking, yoga, and many more. And tourism diversification has been used as the strategy for market growth by many destinations, but it has also been known to cause confusion regarding destination image, to reproduce and standardize the experience, and to add extra stress on an exploiter resource. And by developing new activities or choosing new itineraries or new programs, new tour packages, the tour operators also impact destination image, 
destination marketing, and even the sustainability of a place because of their big influence on operational levels. Uh, in this video, uh, I think it's uh, freezing, but I think you can see there are some tour, uh, is a, I got this from a tour operator's blog and social media, and you can see a group of tourists doing yoga while penguins, I don't know if you can see because, oh, you can see a penguin coming very close to them while they are doing yoga in the open space in Antarctica. Uh, I really like this citation from Young. It is from 1999, but it's still very up to date in my opinion. He says that a crucial part of the general social construction of a tourist place is connected to the meanings, aesthetics, and values associated with a destination that are produced and reproduced by the tourism industry. And tourism products and experiences, they are sold ahead of consumption meaning that the pre-travel, the dreaming of a destination, the excitement to get there, uh, the ideas, concepts, or the stories we hear before getting to a destination, they are also part of a general tourism experience. And this makes uh, tourism very sensitive to marketing, very sensitive to destination image, to tourism experiences share on social media, and finally to the values associated with a destination. And what are the values associated to the Antarctic? Well, uh, here we have some of the principles and values described in the general principles of Antarctic tourism. And within them, we can see the intrinsic natural wilderness, historical values, and also focus on enrichment and education. And in the protocol of environmental protection, we can find values such as the designation of Antarctica as a natural reserve and a place devoted to peace and science, for example. However, as Case mentioned before, consensus on the understanding of some of these less tangible values and principles is still absent. And an important part of this research also relates to this possibility of gaining more objective knowledge on the meaning of these values and principles and its incorporation in the development, the development of new activities. So I have five research questions that this PhD project aims to answer. Question one is which types of tourist activities have been conducted in the Antarctic? And here we can see that there have been marathons, apart from all the examples already uh, that I already mentioned, there have been marathons, fat biking, um, many different things happening. Uh, question two relates on how do tour operators perceive the demands and to what extent they foresee to respond to such demands. And then question three aims to understand what developments tour operators foresee for the next 20 years related to the diversification of tourism. In this first picture, uh, you can see a submersible dive equipment. Uh, this company offers this machine with three seats, so you can have underwater diving experiences without getting cold. Uh, this is a very new development. And the second picture, uh, the same company advertises the only high-end luxury camping sites in the, the continent with a private chef, dining options going from breakfast to six course dinners. And to get to this camp, you need to uh, go on a private jet or charter on an airplane to get there. Question number four is regarding the policies that have been suggested for addressing concerns related to tourism diversification and the arguments both that supported or went against those policies. And finally, question five, aims to understand how those values and principles from ATS receive recognition in a framework for conducting this pre-assessment uh, relating to new activities. Therefore, uh, this research will start with a literature rev review on the topics of Antarctic tourism, tourism diversification, policy discussions, and the less tangible principles and values of the ATS, aiming to answer research questions one and two. And later, a scooping survey with tour operators will be performed in order to estimate their expectations about future tourist demands 
as well as to understand how their process of tourist product development is developed. This will be followed by semi-structured interviews with a range of operators from different scales, experiences, and associations, uh, even if they're not from the Antarctic, aiming to answer research questions two and three. Complementing these interviews, there will be participatory research on site, shadowing and monitoring activities as they unfold. And then finally, a Delphi study amongst expert operators through iterative rounds um, to understand how they build an image of the current and future demand for tourist activities in the Antarctic, and to understand how the less tangible principles and values from the ATS receive recognition and can be incorporated in pre-assessments. And all of this will then form the constituent parts of a pre-assessment framework aiming to provide knowledge for the Committee of Environmental Protection uh, on the development uh, on this pre-assessment. Well, for now, this is it. I am very excited to start this research very soon. Uh, and I'm very open to feedbacks, comments, and suggestions. Uh, you can reach me by my email. I still don't have access to the university email, but soon we are pretty sure this is going to be the same name. Otherwise, you can contact Edward or Case, or you can also find me on LinkedIn. There is literally only one Yosra Makansi in the whole world, so it's really not hard to find. Uh, here are the references, and thank you very much for your time, and it's great to be able to share this with a bigger community uh, everywhere in the world. Thank you. Bravo, Yosra. Thank you very much for sharing the uh, theme two of the project. I already have a question in the comment and we have a couple of minutes for some questions. If you have them, feel free to write them in the comment or stick up your hand to show me. So I'll read it out from Pat Mayer here. It's both to Yosra and Michael. When you interviewing tour operators, at what level do you mean? Business owner, office staff, who may develop products, expedition guides, etc. And indeed, one of the issues here is maybe, of course, the fact that uh, this network and of course, all the people who have engaged in research in the Antarctic have extensive networks with tour operators. We'll be very happy. And part of the reason why we're presenting this, of course, is to sort of gain support in, in and of course, getting and establishing these contacts. But uh, to answer the question, uh, Gyosra, Michael, do you have any input or, uh, or this is of course something we will plan of course better when the research unfolds yeah. so yeah, I, I, yeah. I agree with you edward i think we can uh, plan this better but i think it would be very great to have all levels of uh tour operators not only the business owners because uh well one thing is you develop the product but the person that is face to face with the tourists uh have another idea of that and they might know how what demands are uh like are requested by the tourists so i think this is a really good question and i think it's a really good framework to have a lot of different uh experiences and opinions too thank you pat <laughs> and i have a couple of more here in the chat and i'll read them out again peter keller asks will you get the chance to visit antarctica as part of your research now well that is the plan <laughs> to be honest <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there, there is in the research uh, strategy uh, a part of it that we want to go to the Antarctic and visit uh, the tour operators and shadowing their activities. So if everything goes well with Corona, if, I don't know, if everything goes well, yes, it's part, it's in the plan. Yeah, and we hope uh, maybe to tie it even with the event next spring, that is the Ushuaia conference, which would is in the end of the Austral summer. So there is some plan, of course, details are still to emerge. Uh, Machiel uh, pitches in here, will you look at the diversity of leisure activities undertaken by scientists? Well, you, uh, Yosra, I think I can wake up. Uh, <laughs> I think, yeah, I think this is a good question, actually, because as Michael uh, said in his presentation, uh, scientists and tourists in the Antarctic context, they might not, there might not be a differentiation uh, because no one lives there. So everyone would be a tourist. So I think it would be interesting to, to look at them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, if they are engaging in bungee jumping or paragliding or whatever, I guess they are also tourists when they do it in their leisure times or, well, 
it's, it's, it's a good one. And indeed, who is the tourist? That is, of course, a perennial question sort of around the planet, actually, especially in COVID times when borders are being closed and, uh, and uh, for tourism. But then people say, hey, I'm not a tourist. I'm visiting friends, family, you know. Good questions. I don't see em more emerging and no hands in the air. And that's good because we can move on to presentation number three. So Elena, Laura, are you ready? Feel free to share your screen and just take over. Thank you. Can you can you see the slides? We see the yes. slides and we see you. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here today and to have the opportunity to present to you uh, project number three within the PROACT project. Uh, this is a PhD project supervised by Professor Wasmeicher and by Dr. Molinar. My name is Elena, and I am the PhD candidate who will be working on this project. I am originally from Spain, where I studied my Bachelor in Law and a Master in Legal Practice. I am qualified as a lawyer in Spain. Uh, in 2016, I moved to the Netherlands uh, to study uh, LLM in Public International Law at the University of Leiden. And I've been living here since then. In the, I've been engaged as assistant legal counsel in the Permanent Court of Arbitration for three years. And just a few weeks ago, uh, I started this PhD at the University of Tilburg. As you will uh, notice, the, this uh, PhD concerns legal research, and in this sense, it's a different discipline than the projects which have been uh, presented to you so far today. Um, so uh, now I will go over uh, the sections of my presentation. First, I will um, present some background information on the Antarctic Treaty System and some considerations on the approach to tourism regulation within the system. Next, I will turn to the object and purpose of this project and why that the issue it addresses is uh, relevant nowadays. After this, I will um, present my research questions and I will briefly touch upon the methodology that I intend to follow. So let's now turn to the first part of this presentation, uh, the background to the Antarctic uh, Treaty System. The Antarctic Treaty was signed in Washington in 1959 and entered into force in 1961. Uh, there were 12 regional uh, signatories, all of which uh, are consultative parties. Currently, there is a total of 54 contracting parties to the Antarctic Treaty, out of which uh, 29 are consultative parties. Uh, only consultative parties have decision-making capacity within the system. Uh, one of the central points of disagreement between the parties when the treaty was negotiated uh, was the question of Antarctic territorial sovereignty. Uh, amongst the signatories, there were uh, seven claimant states. These are states which uh, put forward uh, claims of uh, territorial sovereignty over parts of Antarctica. These claims are not generally recognized within the international community, but they are uh, partially recognized among some of the claimant uh, states, although not all of them, as some of these claims overlap. There were also two potential claimant states. Uh, these states did not put forward any claim of their own. Uh, but they reserve their rights in this regard, and they do not recognize the, claim, uh, the claims. There were unrest uh, where non-claimant states, these states did not put forward any claim, nor do they recognize uh, any of the other claims. Uh, the parties were not able to uh, settle this issue definitively in the treaty, and thus they reached what is commonly referred to as the agreement to disagree, which is reflected in Article 4 uh, of the treaty. In some, uh, this article provides that nothing in the treaty shall be interpreted as a renunciation by any contracting party uh, to any uh, of any previously asserted rights or claims or basis of claims to territorial sovereignty in Antarctica. And it also um, preserves and is without prejudice uh, to, the to any contracting uh, party's uh, positions as regards the recognition or non-recognition of any other state's claims. The question of uh, sovereignty is closely related to the question of jurisdiction, and the treaty has very scant uh, provisions on uh, jurisdiction. Article 8, paragraph 1 of the treaty provides for uh, the exclusive jurisdiction on the basis of nationality with regard to a very uh, narrow and clearly defined category of persons, namely observers and scientific personnel uh, changed and designated in accordance with the treaty provisions and members of the staffs uh, accompanying these persons. 
it is explicitly provided that this provision is without prejudice to the parties' positions um, relating to jurisdiction to over any other persons in Antarctica. With regard to the later category, as we will see in a moment, the treaty provides uh, that the consultative parties may adopt measures in jurisdiction. However, pending the adoption of such measures, um, the treaty adopts a case-by-case -case approach whereby should a dispute arise, the contracting parties shall immediately consult, the contracting parties of state in the dispute shall immediately consult together so as to uh, achieve a mutually acceptable solution. As just mentioned, uh, the treaty provides for the consultative parties uh, adopting measures regarding uh, questions relating to the exercise of jurisdiction in Antarctica in the consultative meetings. However, no such measures have been adopted by the consultative parties in such meetings. To finalize the background and Antarctic Treaty System, I will just uh, briefly touch upon the Protocol on Environmental Protection to the Antarctic Treaty, also known as the Madrid Protocol. Uh, this is uh, generally known as uh, including an environmental pillar to the system, and it applies to all human activities in Antarctica, therefore also to tourism. With regard to compliance uh, with these obligations, uh, the treaty provides uh, for the contracting party's obligation to adopt measures within their competence, such as uh, laws and regulations. And these are coupled with some notification obligations. Therefore, in summary, uh, the, the protocol refers to enforcement uh, in the domestic sphere of the parties. Now, uh, we uh, I will uh, briefly uh, comment on some considerations on the approach uh, to tourism regulation within the system. As uh, from the above, it appears that uh, the fundamental disagreement over sovereignty in Antarctica has had a big impact on the functioning of the Antarctic Treaty System. The parties have avoided the discussion on jurisdictional issues due to the close relationship of these with the question of sovereignty, and thus they're being considered as highly sensitive for the parties. This has resulted in uncertainty concerning jurisdiction. At the same time, the, consens the consensus decision-making procedures uh, whereby uh, if a consultative party disagrees, uh, this would prevent the adoption of a, of a measure, together with increasing number of consultative parties, uh, has uh, affected their ability to reach decisions. This has been already presented to you in the general presentation. At the same time, as we have also seen in the previous uh, presentations, uh, tourism operators have uh, developed a quite a uh, better developed system of, of self-regulation, which might have also dissipated the sense of urgency for the parties to adopt uh, their own measures within the system. Altogether, this results in quite a piecemeal or ad hoc uh, approach, a uh, mostly reactive approach to tourism policy making and regulation within the system. And now we will turn to the object and purpose of this uh, PZ in particular. In the absence of uh, general jurisdictional provisions at the international level, the contracting parties have adopted their own uh, choices in terms of jurisdictional scope of their domestic implementation legislation. So the aim of this project is to conduct a comparative legal analysis of, the, of these jurisdictional scopes of uh, the contracting parties domestic implementation in order to map out what is the collective reach uh, of the parties with regard to tourism in Antarctica, as well as uh, their shortcomings. We submitted this issue is relevant, particularly nowadays, as compared with, uh, say, 50 years ago, due to the exponential growth of uh, tourism activities in Antarctica and their diversification. This results in the fact that most people in Antarctica are, in terms of numbers, uh, are tourists, and there's an absence of clear uh, jurisdictional provisions regarding them. As you can see in the slide, there are several potential jurisdictional bases, which might be uh, asserted by states in any particular case, and this could potentially lead to uh, loopholes, to overlaps, and even to conflicts. Let's see an hypothetical example. A tourist expedition might be organized in the Netherlands. It might depart uh, to Antarctica from Argentina on a best uh, flagged in Nigeria, which is a non-contracting party. And it might include a uh, crew of um, uh, tourists uh, of, different, of 15, for example, different nationalities, including both contracting parties and non-contracting parties. In a circumstance such as this, one can imagine a myriad of potential issues which might arise which concern jurisdiction, such as which state or states would have and or should have, uh, should exercise sorry, uh, jurisdiction over different events such as breaches of environmental obligations pursuant to the protocol or tort law claims or even criminal law cases. 
I will now present to you my research questions. Uh, the first one is, what is the jurisdictional scope of application of the contracting parties domestic uh, legislation implementing the protocol and other ATS regulations addressing Antarctic tourism? Which loopholes, overlaps, and conflicts appear to result from uh, such different jurisdictional scopes in, ter in their domestic legislations? Are these being addressed by the contracting parties? And if so, how and to what extent? Uh, second, to what extent may developments concerning tourism growth and diversification magnify any identified shortcomings? Third, to what extent may different choices in terms of jurisdictional scope encroach or, uh, encroach or assist in the implementation of tradable visitation permits and uh, pre-assessment frameworks for novel or particularly concerning activities as studied in researches by researchers in the previous projects presented to you earlier today? And fourth, which specific policy proposals may be suggested to address any issues identified? In order to answer these questions, uh, I intend to conduct a literature review, which I have recently started, to work on the definition of the problem, the definition of the terminology, the scope of the study, as well as limitations, including subject matter limitations. I also aim to study the concept of jurisdiction in international law, including novel uh, formulations, which might be useful in this context. I will turn towards a comparative study of the jurisdictional scope of all contracting parties uh, domestic implementation legislation. This will mostly consist in desk research, but it will also include an empirical component consistent in qualitative interviews with uh, authorities and experts. The purpose of these steps is to obtain, as mentioned before, an overview of the contracting party's collective reach in terms of jurisdiction over Antarctic tourism and any um, shortcomings here, with the ultimate aim to suggest a specific policy proposal to address the issues identified. And once again, like my colleagues already said, we would like to uh, invite you to think with us as we embark on this project and we welcome any feedback and comments that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Elena, Laura. A very concise and clear overview of the project. We already have a question and some clapping hands in the audience, of course, and, and already just, uh, well, maybe a comment from Dimitri, I guess, uh, more uh, interesting issue surrounding the rights of workers on cruises. For instance, what happens if they're ill and have to be repatriated? Now, these are indeed some of the uh, challenges, I guess. Uh, and another one from Pat Mayer here, and workers is relative. Expedition staff may be first world based, but ship staff, yeah, ship staff may be third world, third world based. Yeah, this, uh, we're already identifying some potential loopholes here, I guess. Would you like to react to this, Elena, Laura, these two comments? Uh well, I'm still in the process of reviewing the literature and uh, starting the definition of the problem. So I'm not sure uh, still what the subject uh, scope of the, pro uh, of the problem is going to be, if it's going to include the rights of workers or not. I'm still in a preliminary phase. I think the bulk of the center of the question will concern the environmental obligations under the protocol, but this is still uh, to be defined more, more precisely in the, in the coming period. Uh, this is indeed an interesting aspect, uh, the, the tour, uh, tourism workers aspect. Well done. Oh, and it's your birthday. <laughs> so that, that, that warrants a particular reaction because there is, a, there is a button for that, that this one here, yeah, the, the, the cornet, the, the, the exploding cornet. It, <laughs> thank <it's>, you. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you very much and uh, happy birthday. And uh, thank you for your, Deborah says, thank you for your clear and succinct presentation. Good to see your work linking directly with the other work on this project. Uh, question, are you planning to set out policy options or propose specific policy as a result of your work? Is it options or policy or specific policy? Uh, well, any reflections at this stage? Well, it's a very preliminary stage. So uh, I think uh, would be either, uh, yeah, I, could, I cannot really tell uh, whether, I think the options would be best to give more flexibility, but uh, I still have not get to the point yet. No, but uh, yeah, you're, you're, you're inclined towards providing options rather than uh, uh, specific policy and, and Deborah says here agreed. Right, it's uh, thank you again. And let's move on to the last of the theme presentations. And that is Solen uh, will present next. And I'll ask you now to share your screen Solen and let's see yes. if it's working. Um, I think it should be. Um, okay. Thank you. Yes, your screen is there. 
your yep. your yes. face is there and your voice is audible so go on the floor very is yours. good um and here yeah. now it should be in slideshow yes very good um so hello everyone good morning good afternoon or good evening if like me you're based in central uh, europe uh, in the Netherlands. So I'm Solène Gugisberg and uh, I'm going to be introducing the last theme of uh, this PROACT project, which is the role of non-use and non-user states in safeguarding ATS fundamental principles and values. So first of all, the team. Uh, my supervisors are Eric Rolena and Kaspar Smaya. Um, as you can see from these pictures, they are ready to go to cold weather um, areas of the world, and they have both been to polar areas. I have not yet, but I hope so uh, during this project. And I can also get ready uh, for cold weather. So um, a few words about myself. Uh, I'm a legal scholar specialized in public international law. I'm currently, uh, since a month now, doing uh, a second postdoc at Utrecht University. Um, my last postdoc, uh, in that case, I focused mainly on fisheries and the law of the sea. And during my PhD in Germany, I focused on fisheries and conservation. Aside from uh, these years spent in academia, I've worked in the field of international dispute settlements uh, within an international court and as counsel um, at the European Commission in uh, their fight against illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing, and as an international consultant for various institutions and organizations. I'm from a landlocked country, Switzerland, so my interest in marine fisheries has always surprised people. Uh, for those who know me, uh, very well, or just a little bit. Um, my new area of focus on the Antarctic is coming as even more of a surprise because I've always been vocal in that I prefer warm weather. So um, I've already had my family asking what I'm thinking I'm doing, but uh, I'm very excited to discover a new field, new issues, uh, as well as meeting a new community of academics and practitioners. So thank you for giving me the chance to introduce myself today and the project I'll be working on. So what is the rationale for the research under theme four? I'm not going to say anything revolutionary when pointing out that uh, tourism is generally seen as under-regulated within the ATS. This is in part, but in no way uh, totally due to the consensus rule. A single state is able to block consensus and hence block the adoption of regulations limiting use of the Antarctic environment. That means that the default situation, the starting point of the ATS regarding activities such as tourism allows use. But non-use is also relevant to the Antarctic as it has been designated as a nature reserve in the environmental protocol, as we've seen uh, in previous presentations. Consultative parties have also recognized in the general principle of Antarctic tourism that tourism should not be allowed to contribute to long-term degradation of the Antarctic environment. So the question is, how can one ensure that non-use is given adequate recognition? Another way of uh, approaching the question is to acknowledge that non-user states have legitimate aims to pursue and to ask what avenues are open to them to see their interests taken into account. The aim of the research, um, against this background, I intend um, on the basis of a comparative study with other regimes on global goods and common to identify best practices and provide policy recommendations. One, to enable proper recognition of non-use, and two, to further the interest of non-user states. All of this in order to better regulate tourism in the ATS in a manner that respects the fundamental values and principles of that regime. The structure of the next five years of research is built on four pillars. 
uh, I will start with definitional and conceptual questions related to non-use and non-user states in general. Second, I will turn to the ATS and how it encompasses non-use and non-user states in its regime. I'll then move to a comparative study on the role of non-use and non-user states in other regimes. And all of that will lead, hopefully, uh, to the ultimate goal of the research, namely uh, to identify best practices and provide policy recommendations that are relevant for regulating tourism in the ATS. In more detail, pillar by pillar, uh, first, non-use and non-user states, definitions and concepts. I will start by examining what is understood by non-use, and in order to do so, I will also be examining what is meant by use um, in other regimes on global goods and commons, such as those regulating climate change, fisheries, whaling, deep sea and mining, or space. I will then try to clarify what the rationales are for giving non-users a voice, and what the risks may be of doing so. In a second stage, the ATS, non-use and non-user states, with tourism in mind, but not the exclusive focus of this research sub theme, I will examine to what extent the ATS allows or facilitates non-use, allows or facilitates a role for non-user states, ensures uh, an appropriate balance between use and non-use, and user and non-user states. Also, on the basis of the statements at consultative meetings and maybe other public statements, I will look at the positions of consultative parties on the concept of non-use and non-user states. Knowing um, who the decision-making states uh, and also other actors consider legitimate stakeholders can be very interesting. China, for example, has been largely opposed to non-fishing states joining Kamlar. Um, although that particular regime explicitly provides for membership by states involved in scientific research. So what, um, what are the reasons given and obviously what are the consequences of such point of view by states? Moving to the third pillar, um, a comparison of the role of non-use and non-user states in other regimes. I'll be looking into how other regimes on global goods and commons include or do not include non-use as an objective and non-user states as stakeholders. Um, please note here the inverted commas. I know that the term stakeholder is loaded and may actually not be adequate here, especially when talking about states. But until I complete part one of my research, uh, I ask for understanding regarding terminology and um, suggestions if you have any. Other questions I will examine are how the tension between users and non-users has played out in these regimes and what other factors um, are influencing the continued success or lack thereof of these regimes. There, obviously, um, a regime that will be important to examine is uh, the International Whaling Commission. Uh, since the moratorium on commercial whaling, non-use has become the starting point in that regime, um, with now a three-quarter majority of states, parties needed to allow use again. And the moratorium came into being because many non-user states joined the regime but not all actors are happy with the change. An Inuit representative once um, wondered quite loudly about why there was a Swiss delegate at the IWC meeting. And uh, Japan has left the IWC because it considers that its interests as user state are not represented anymore. So now it acts outside of the system. So, it's complicated and balancing interests is, um, is a very um, difficult, too much uh, users so that they leave. Then um, finally, the best practices and policy recommendations for the regulation of tourism within the ATS. 
under this pillar, I would like to answer four questions or more if they come up, but for now, the four questions in order to provide policy recommendations. Um, are the definitions of non-use, non-use estate adequate to regulate and part of tourism? How could some of the lessons learned from other regimes be translated into the ATS for the regulation of tourism? What course of action would be possible under the existing legal regime for states individually as a coalition of the willing or through decisions of the ATCM? And finally, what modifications, uh, procedural or more structural, could be suggested should states want to change the status quo? So that's a lot of questions so far and no answer. So um, that's why I have five years in front of me, but it's also where you all come in. And um, as my colleagues, I welcome, I'm looking forward to your comments, questions and ideas to improve the research plan or just to exchange on the substance of these issues. Your feedback is most welcome now or later per email. Uh, I can always be reached um, at my Utrecht University email address. Thank you for uh, your attention and I leave you with some last penguins for a second. Thank you, Jolene. And uh, we're back onto the main screen here. Thank you. Already the uh, chat is erupting with a few, couple, two comments at least. <laughs> Um, Machiel and Debra are commenting a little bit here. The Machiel is wondering about the relation between use and membership is interesting. Some use states, the UK, have facilitated use science of former non-users, Malaysia in this case, to integrate critical non-use member states to the exclusivity of the ATS. Would these be examples to be to considered? Any Definitely. comments there? Definitely. Um, well, but I... Yeah, I will be most happy to discuss all of that with you since uh, you know so much more uh, and I've just started. Um, but yes, definitely these are the problematics that are so interesting and sometimes behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And uh, Deborah mentions three uh, barriers to more effective tourism policy making in Antarctica that, that we have not mentioned yet. One being the lack of tourism expertise on ATP delegations. Mm -hmm. Two, limited institutional memory of tourism policy amongst AP, ATP delegations. And the third one, the turnover rates of policymakers on, the, on these delegations. So basically, yeah, the, the, these, uh, they are interrelated and, for, and sort of pivot on the ATP delegations and how they are set up and organized. And yeah, that's a very interesting point, of course, uh, that Julie noted. Uh, any reactions, Solen, on this? Um, or well, in a way, it's good news. Uh, these are the kind of limitations that can be overcome um, and the provision of policy briefs or information papers. And if they need to be provided every time, well, so be it. That, that's also okay. Um, more worrying is if there are some states that, uh, and I'm sure they are, that have clearly expressed they want no regulation to move forward. Because then, with the consensus rule, um, the options get limited to unilateral action or coalition of the willing. So, in a way, I take your, your comments as very positive. This is something we can work on. Indeed, thank you. Uh, Deborah, thank you for the comment. Uh, something to be worked on, indeed. And, and maybe if, if it's taken, well, maybe it's an issue of taking it seriously also from the, uh, from the countries composing those delegations. But Pat Mayer adds here, of course, that some states have internal issues. But I'm not sure I follow what is in the inverted commas here from you, Pat. Maybe you want to explain a little bit. Sure, it's, uh, it's similar to Debra, Deborah's uh, concern. So we've got this rotating door where every year it's a new person or a new you know, individual at the table, maybe a new office that goes to these uh, conversations. So again, there's not, the inst there's not the organizational history from the Canadian delegation, but on the flip side, in, in many senses, Canada has this long history, right? With a company like Canboric Air that's been doing all of the flying for tourism operators and ATS states um, since forever. So, so even within a Canadian context, on one hand, we've got no, you know, 
50 years of organizational memory uh, about what's happening. I see Case wanting to pitch in here and also note the two comments here where Machiel indicates that Switzerland is a case of an interested non-EU state, which Solen, you could maybe reflect on. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> but let's Case, uh, floor to you a little bit. Yes, just re uh, to reflect on the issues uh, that uh, Deborah and uh, Peter are raising, very important issues. Um, actually, I um, agree particularly with the turnover rates of policymakers. That's a, a concern. But lack of knowledge is actually, uh, yeah, I'm afraid not the biggest problem because um, quite often there are information papers uh, reflecting on the summarizing the discussions. Also in 2019, a workshop on uh, actually um, uh, taking stock in the, in the, and, and summarizing the, acti the discussion over the last 20 to 30 years. So I'm afraid that there are also uh, just uh, quite some delegations uh, having quite a, a, a high level of knowledge on tourism that is going on, but also the, the discussions in the ATCM, uh, which indicates actually that there might also be uh, bigger problems. And one of those problems relates, for instance, to um, what is the standard to, uh, for, for your uh, regulations? So uh, Joshra's uh, project, Project 2, how to work with the concept of wilderness in, uh, in developing uh, uh, tourism policy, for instance, because there seems also to be uh, quite a, a different views on uh, what types of tourists uh, are tourism is acceptable or not. So I agree these are important points, but um, if these were the concerns, um, they could be addressed, uh, but I'm afraid it's, it's more complex even. So very interesting to, uh, to research, but thanks for the, uh, the it's very important. Yeah, indeed. Thank you, Case, for reflecting on that. And, and this is maybe, of course, the bigger context for this very project. And maybe just to wrap a little bit together these four presentations before opening the floor completely. Now, I want to say, of course, this project is being funded by the Dutch Research Council, the NVO, uh, which is then, of course, putting the Dutch uh, into, into a position to address this with with a very solid knowledge base, as, as has been highlighted here. Uh, but also I recognize, I want to just emphasize how we are literally just starting this project. As you notice, Yosra is coming in a couple of weeks to, to the Netherlands. Uh, so then everybody has said that they have been only a few weeks starting and indeed we are literally just kicking this off. So what we present here is the vision for the project that was, that, that was bought by the uh, Dutch Research Council to fund us. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and of course, as we all know, with research developing, things might change a little bit in the progress. And that's, of course, why we are talking now to get input and ideas and thoughts. Also, last, I want to recognize the fact that this is a very international consortium of people in the, in the project. We have uh, with national backgrounds from Spain, Switzerland, Brasilia, uh, Brazil, sorry, um, um, Iceland, the US, and then of course the Dutch. And, uh, and I really look forward to, of course, working to, with, with these uh, backgrounds, with, these, with this mix of people that we have put onto the task of uh, addressing the world's last commons, so to speak. And then of course, my particular project, which has to do with, uh, with the OSRA and CASE on these very intangible values that we associate with these final commons of the planet, let's say wilderness, pristine, all of these things, do we put them into practice, into a thing like a legal instrument, a management instrument, tourism per se, and et cetera? This is, these are interesting questions, I hope, and we want to address them. So I want to turn to the, uh, to the chat here a little bit and just open the floor for a few minutes before we then draw this session to a conclusion by Pat. I notice here in the, uh, uh, in the chat, ATPs from Debra are responsible for so many other issues. Oh yeah, this is the discussion of uh, that case was addressing. Uh, some comments on this is a nice suite of project and it's timely. I appreciate this. Thank you, Richard Ricardo Raura says thank you all for your presentations. They are all terrific research projects. They're all aspects of significant policy relevance. The question is, do you anticipate an impact of the pandemic on the research program? Antarctic tourism is going to change and that could potentially influence some of the assumptions. Yes, no. <laughs> what will COVID do? 
Um, and then another one from Peter Keller. Let's address these two together. Need to go. Oh, yes. He's basically thanking and uh, machine taught scenes. Yes, maybe in Ushuaia. Thank you, Peter. And, and best of luck for the next meeting. But let's think about that. COVID, how could that influence? I mean, Michael touched upon it in his presentation, and I share that, uh, that belief that tourism, once it resumes, it will resume with a vengeance. As Michael put it, people are chomping on the bits to get going again. And yeah, that, that might even put all of these challenges into a starker contrast than before. But uh, I open for differing opinions. Michael, I see your... Yeah, it's it's very interesting. I think this question, and uh, because yeah, it's it's it, it may be similar to the situation that we had, uh, I think, twelve years ago, when also the pressure on the on the policymakers was was rising, and then suddenly the the global uh, financial crisis hit, and and the, and the pressure was off again, right? Uh, so 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 maybe we are facing something similar here, but. Um, I think we can think about it in, 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 in two ways. It, it will either be a business as, as, as usual, uh, let's say after this, uh, this pandemic, I think, or we are in a very interesting, um, let's say moment to rethink, right? To reflect on, on, on whether, uh, on, on how things are, are going, because I think it's very clear that the last 10 years, um, uh, yeah, have been have been very similar to yeah the ten years before that. So so there is something about uh, the, the 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 yeah the the system that that needs fixing and that needs thinking. So I think that is how we should approach it. Eric pitches in with build back better, and if I reflect back on the uh, two thousand eight financial crisis, the the debate now has been very very loud about how to build back better and how to and that you can actually rethink things uh, in in 208 people I did, I did not notice that as much especially with tourism well maybe that's my natural background because tourism actually saved Iceland from the abyss of the financial crash but uh, maybe maybe I'm tainted by that but mayor says into it there was an urgency to rebound yeah to save economies exactly and, and indeed in 21, there may be the ethical issue for tourism in general, public health, et cetera. Well, the, yeah, this is indeed issues that you see in the chat there by what Pat is pitching. How will vaccination passports, for instance, influence this? Deborah says, in July 2020, the Antarctic tour operators offering the private jet trips to the luxury pods in Antarctica presented at the Eco Hotel Summit. Right, so they are prepping. And I guess those who are, can afford a private jet trip to the luxury pods will be vaccinated, I guess. Uh, not be a problem there. Um, any other comments? I'm also looking at the time that I want to give Pat a couple of minutes to wrap up. What about whether COVID will be introduced to the marine environment in Antarctica now? I maybe call upon Michael here, the Biologist, the one with the biology background, <laughs> the, the only one of us, at least, I think, with a biology background to maybe reflect on that. I, I don't know. I... No. <laughs> <laughs> most likely, most likely not. Well, it might, no, might species jump not. to penguin. <laughs> okay. I, I, I well, think the first seal, I, I think the first seal might be susceptible. The first seal. The first yeah, seal. Yeah. <laughs> Penguins well, then, just, then we just social distance from the fur seals, you know, as we visit. And I think that's fine for wildlife as well, just to keep. <laughs> yeah. Now, it's a big question. Uh, the uh, the post-COVID tourism, how it will look. They did vaccinate gorillas in San Diego. Yeah, that's true. We could... <laughs> right. I see this is uh, this is uh, descending into uh, into into a bit of bantering. So that is, of course, all fine. But uh, maybe because it's late evening, at least where I am. So, Pat, I want to give you the uh, floor to sort of wrap up and uh, and share uh, the final thoughts and maybe your final reflections on the session, please. You are um, muted. There we go. Pat. Wonderful. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for yeah, attending. I, I knew um, I would get that one on the Zoom bingo. 
<laughs> I know. Thank you, everyone, for attending. It was a, an absolutely fantastic webinar. Thank you to all our speakers for, you know, taking the the, the first dip into the uh, Antarctic pool here for us and, and offering this webinar first um, as we sort of wait for the ability to meet in Ushuaia in, uh, in April 2022. Um, so, so thank you for that. I think all the themes came together extremely well, and, and I really value the conversations and questions, etc. Um, if you would like to stay, uh, I'll, I'll keep Zoom open. If you want to discuss the conference further, have any specific questions, I know that we have um, Maris Hall from the uh, uh, organize, organizing committee in, uh, in Ushuaia here on the call. We've got a number of other members of the IPTRN steering committee here on the call. So, so if you do want more details or you want to have a conversation um, af after I've done my two cents here, we'll turn off the recording and we can we can just sit here and enjoy each other's company. Um, if you do want to get more information, um, you can see our website there on the screen, as well as our Facebook and our Twitter handle. Um, and on, on the website right now, you'll be able to find more details about our next um, webinar, which is coming up on April 29th, um, and that is um, at a similar time, uh, a little bit earlier uh, in Europe, um, but it's a webinar on exploring the meanings and practices of cultural sensitivity in tourism. So this is an Arctic focused um, webinar, and we did that purposefully, obviously, as the IPTRN, we wanna have a little bit from both polls, um, and we're doing this uh, jointly with Atlas UArctic, um, the Artisan project is the actual project that will be presented and it's uh, funded by the Northern Periphery and Arctic Program of the European Union. So um, with that, thank you, Edward, for hosting. Thank you to all our presenters again. Thank you to all attendees. Um, now is the time when you're able to go off to your other, other dealings uh, or you're welcome to, to hang out if that's what you need at this time of day. So thank you very much. Uh, and with that, we'll stop the recording.